All right, I guess I get to introduce Ed Felton. Uh, Ed has been uh, party to lots of controversy. So unlike, uh, I don't know who you can think of, and Richard Nixon has also been involved in controversy. He's <laughs> someone who's dead. Uh, Ed's has always been illuminating and uh, constructive. So uh, I guess I first met Ed in connection with a lot of uh, uh, issues that he and his uh, Successful graduate students dug up uh, related to Java security. Uh, he's since been involved in things like the uh, Microsoft Department of Justice Antitrust case, broke a lot of DRM systems uh, by this clever method of looking at the patents, right? That was one of the tricks. Yeah, OK, so I've got some tricky things. He was the first chief technologist of the FTC, and uh, many other things that I won't list because we all can't list that. So, all right. So, um, as John said, I'm a computer scientist, but I'm involved. Um, I've been involved a fair amount in public policy, um, and so I want to talk about one one example of um, how those things come together. In particular, I'll talk about the NSA's mass phone call data program, and I'm going to apply some easy computer science to some of the issues that arise around this thing. So that um, and uh, try to shed some light on it. A lot of what uh, I end up doing in my policy engagement is to explain blindingly obvious computer science to policymakers in a way that they'll hopefully understand, or at least um, uh, state it with confidence while being an Ivy League professor, uh, which um, often carries more weight than you right uh, in Washington. All right. So here's the program we're talking about. This uh, uh, this. Uh, Guardian story broke in the Guardian back in June that the uh, NSA is collecting phone records of, in this said, millions of Verizon customers, but we later learned from lots of other U.S. phone providers as well. So what I want to talk about basically is um, uh, is uh, a few things today. First, um, uh, what we know about this NSA program and what it does, uh, how it works. Uh, I'll do, a, I'll do some analysis to try to shed light on how useful the program actually would be in trying to find bad guys. Um, I'll talk a little bit about whether it can be made more privacy friendly so that there are different ways of organizing and uh, the data and computing to, uh, uh, to make it more privacy friendly while still uh, being just as effective. Um, and then some concluding thoughts. All right, what do we know about this thing? Um, well, for many or most domestic phone calls, uh, we know that the NSA collects um, information uh, which, uh, about who called whom, when the call was made, and for how long they talked. There's some dispute about whether it is for essentially all domestic phone calls or for fewer of them. Um, originally, it was reported as nearly all. Later, um, uh, unnamed NSA sources said it was only uh, 20 to 30 percent, and just recently a high NSA official said um, under oath that uh, it's about 20 to 30 percent under this program, meaning um, <laughs> that's a lower bound. Uh, so we don't really know exactly how many calls, and I'll talk some about how the degree of coverage actually matters for the effectiveness of the program later. Um, all this stuff they call metadata, they use the term metadata in a way that isn't really the same way that computer scientists use it, but it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, when you say metadata in Washington, what you mean is this stuff. Um, who called whom, when the call was made, and for how long they talked. In contrast to the, the voice audio content of the call. Now, the, all that's for domestic calls, for calls that are either foreign, uh, foreign to foreign, or one end foreign, one end domestic. They, uh, they collect metadata wherever possible. Um, you might as well assume they collect all metadata. Um, and in some cases, they collect content. There's no legal limit, really, on their ability to collect content overseas uh, from non-US persons. Um, the, the, the boundary cases where it's one end foreign, or where there's a person who's American on one end of the connection, or they're not sure whether the people are American, the law is ambiguous, and as far as we know, they pretty much collect it. OK. But I'm going to focus here on the domestic case. So domestic calls where they have just information about who called whom and so on. So uh, the first thing they obviously do with this is they build a data structure which we'll call the call graph. It's a graph that has a node for each phone number and has an edge between two nodes if those numbers have talked to each other at all in the last five years. Uh, so that's the call graph. And then they do some computations on the call graph. In particular, there are two computations that they do. The first one is called contact chaining, and the second one, well, there's one that's always redacted in the documents. <laughs> it's there. Um, there's a 
Typically, in a court order authorizing the program, there's about a third of a page about contact chaining, and there's about two thirds of a page about some redacted thing um, with some redacted footnotes. So we don't know what the second <laughs> thing is, but contact chaining we know about. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is. Do you have a guess on the other one? Uh, do I have a guess as to what the other one is? Um, what is the black rectangle? Yeah. Um, do we want to white? I have some guesses. I'll, I'll talk later about what they are. Um, all right, so now I have a couple weird slides I don't understand. All right, um, oh, okay, uh, PowerPoint book. All right. Uh, and by context yes. chaining, you mean generically either clustering in graph definitions or pathing? Here's what they say. What they say is they look for all paths of length up to three hops or up to two hops. Um, they call it contact chaining. Some of the details are redacted. Um, I would say to the extent that they do any kind of sort of sophisticated clustering or look for a more um, uh, for uh, relationships that are more complex than just short um, distance between two entities, um, that, that would fit under number two. Um, my guess is to number two, actually, let me just answer that very briefly. Yeah, I'll come back to some a more specific examples later. But the guess is that the, the redacted one is basically aiming to counter some particular form of trade that the uh, target organizations use. For example, people throwing away uh, phones and switching to new burner phones. Um, uh, you might be trying to identify uh, what phone the person has switched to. But we don't know for sure. Um, so this is what's going on. There's been a bunch of legal and policy fights about this. Um, I've been involved in this in various forms. I've filed affidavits. I've testified and so on. Um, one of the biggest arguments that one hears in favor of this program is the idea that it's only metadata, and therefore, we shouldn't have to worry too much about the content. Now, if you know much about data and what can be inferred from data, this really doesn't, um, uh, this, really, this should not really impress you that much. And if, but if, and if you think in any kind of detail about what people do on the phone, um, and the fact that people tend to use the phone for those communications that are most sensitive, because they don't want to commit them to writing, um, what you get is, um, is a lot of sensitivity here. First of all, sensitive calls, right? Suppose somebody calls the suicide hotline at 1.15 a.m. and talks for 45 minutes. Right? That's just metadata. We don't know anything about what they talked about. Um, there are all kinds of numbers such that calling that number or that number calling you says something about you. If the, uh, let's say, the reminder service that your doctor uses to remind you of an appointment the next morning calls you tonight, it's pretty obvious what that means. It means you have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. Um, and there are lots, of, lots and lots of examples, and examples that have to do not only with personal details, but also with public policy. For example, if an NSA employee calls the fraud, waste, and abuse line at the NSA Inspector General's office, that goes in this database and is potentially available to NSA analysts. Um, and that also is, um, is um, problematic. So sensitive calls, patterns of calls even more so. You can, and you can tell all kinds of stories about this back and forth with, say, different medical specialists or, um, um, or so on. Um, a pattern of calls between people might tell you something about the nature of their relationship. It might tell you about the beginning or end of a relationship. It might talk, tell you about a professional relationship um, or changes and so on. And of course, there's all the standard big data types of analysis where people um, train on a large data set to, uh, to, to build predictive models that let you figure out things like a person's family status, their health, how happy their marriage is, um, how, whether they have kids or not, whether they're a student, et cetera, et cetera. All kinds of things like this, the sorts of things you would expect if you know about how people use data. There's all kinds of uh, inferences you can make about a person based on their, their call patterns. And of course, the largest data set, a data set much bigger than any that's available to any researchers, even the ones at the phone companies, is uh, held by, by NSA. Uh, and so there is a serious um, privacy issue here. And that's now finally, I think, being recognized by the policy world. So, so that's led to suggestions for reform. Uh, the first major reform suggestion came from a report of the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technology. This was a group of five um, DC lawyers. <coughs> who um, were appointed by the president to take a look at this program. And in mid-December, they released a, a really substantive and um, surprisingly hard-hitting report uh, of, of a couple hundred pages, which um, this is the cover of. Um, and they said two things that are significant about this particular program. Um, 
First, they said, our review suggests that the information contributed to terrorist investigations by the use of this data was not essential to preventing attacks and could readily have been obtained in a timely manner using conventional court orders. Now, turns out that um, when press, administration officials can, uh, the only success they can point to is that they um, arrested a cab driver in San Diego for donating $8,000 to, a, 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 to a, a group in Somalia that, um, that has engaged in attacks against, uh, against US forces. Um, that's the, the one and only success that arguably came from this program. That has been publicly, yes. Um, the case is publicly known. Um, and there have been all kinds of claims that have been made, but under oath when pressed, um, the only one that seems to stand up at all is the, the case of this cab driver, the same cab driver. Um, the other thing that this group did is they made a recommendation. We recommend that legislation should be enacted that terminates the storage of bulk telephony metadata by the government and transitions as soon as reasonably possible to a system in which such metadata is held instead, either by private providers or by a private third party. Now, when the president gave his big speech about, uh, the, about <coughs> surveillance in, on January 17th, he actually endorsed both of these ideas, or at least um, semi-endorsed them. That is, he talked about the efficacy of the program. He just tended to disagree. But he also directed the, um, uh, the administration to decide um, by March 28th um, on a strategy with respect to reorganizing how the data is held. So I want to talk about two, I want to do two little bits of computer science, computer science analysis to look at um, the two questions that are raised by these two quotes. First, um, how useful would this program be? Or at least how useful would contact chain be in actually catching bad guys? Uh, and second, uh, how feasible would it be to redesign this program so that the data is not held by the government? Okay, so first, how useful is contact chain? And in order to do that, let's look at this scenario here. So the scenario is that an intelligence analyst has some evidence suggesting that um, some person, who I'll call Bob, might be a terrorist. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm not a terrorist. Yes, Bob? Yeah, I, 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 I should really switch to security for this reason. Okay. Um, I'm not a terrorist. Great. Um, so an, an, the analyst has some evidence suggesting Bob might be a terrorist. Not like strong evidence, but just generating some suspicion. The analyst is then going, then uses the call graph and is going to determine whether Bob is in the near neighborhood of known bad guy, who's someone who is um, who is known to be um, uh, to be uh, involved in, in terrorist activities. So if yes, if Bob is in the near neighborhood of known bad guy, then this is evidence, perhaps weak evidence, that Bob might be a terrorist. And if not, it's weak evidence that Bob is not a terrorist. Now. Um, the uh, terrorist groups know that we do this kind of stuff, and so presumably they're trying to avoid being in each other's near neighborhood in the call graph, but that's harder than it sounds. Um, it takes really rigorous discipline to, make sh to uh, avoid ever within five years uh, having an uh, indirect two-hop connection to someone if you're actually seeing them and coordinating with them. And so there's some substantial probability that the bad guys will slip up and create a link even if they, even if they're trying not to. Yes? So the scenario of the call graph, do they also have like weights or some other extraction? Uh, yeah, well all they do. Um, they have information about every call, when and how long, and you can imagine some kind of scoring function that puts um, a weight on each edge. Um, and um, I'm not going to talk about that here, but you can imagine how you might extend the kind of analysis I'm talking about to include that. Probably they do. At the very least, one of the things they do is try to identify high degree nodes in the graph and move those. Yes? I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood. When you originally mentioned the call graph, <clears throat> it sounded as though the vertices were phone numbers, not yes. people. Is there a robust mapping between those? Or like in practice, yes. Okay. Um, is there a rigorous mapping in practice? Yes. Um, it turns out you can identify most people by, um, uh, you can map most numbers to a person um, by either using um, broadly available commercial databases or, um, um, or um, advanced techniques um, such as Google. And um, uh, in, in any case, the government has subpoena power to get that information. Okay, so it's not as though terrorists could just buy many burner phones. And well, they can buy burner phones, and we'll get to that. Um, it's true that I'm using 
here. Um, it's true that I'm using here um, number and name interchangeably to, uh, to simplify the discussion in practice. Um, you can imagine known bad phone is, um, you can imagine that they're watching Bob's phone because they know it's Bob, um, who they suspect may be a bad guy. And um, for a known bad guy, you can substitute known bad phone. All right, and this is now come to the part of the talk where I really what happens? Which exactly? Yeah. Yeah. Did they, so yeah, that's what happens. Did the projector appear die? Yes, it restarts. Oh yeah, it's okay. Good. So let's take a minute. All right. Okay. So. Um, all right. So this is the this is the scenario, and I'll I'll go on while while he's straightening this out. Um, and now the analysis to do here is actually not that complicated. You want to do some very simple um, uh, application of basis law to this scenario, and then you want to do a little bit of, of, uh, of discussion about graph structure and so on. So uh, with respect to, um, uh, uh, and so let's work through this sort of the, the simple base law argument by looking at uh, a graph. I'm, I'm sorry, this, um, um, this is two by two uh, grid. Uh, where across the top, the columns represent the states of Bob being a terrorist or not a terrorist, and the rows represent um, Bob being in the near neighborhood of known bad guy or not in the near neighborhood of known bad guy. So we'll make some assumptions. We'll say the probability that Bob is a terrorist, that's the analyst prior, after having all the other information that's available to the analyst, but not the call graph. That's the analyst's best estimate of the probability that Bob is um, a bad guy. Now the probability that Bob is in the neighborhood of known bad guy, if he's a terrorist, we'll call that alpha. That represents more or less the likelihood of a failure of tradecraft that causes um, them to be in the neighborhood. And the probability that Bob is in the neighborhood of the terrorist, assuming Bob's not a terrorist, we'll say is Pn, and we'll make that equal to just the probability that two random people happen to be in each other's neighborhood. Right? Okay. So um, now we can now we can plug in the uh, uh, we can plug in the um, uh, the values to each of the four boxes and in the obvious way. All right, now let's make some assumptions. All right, so let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that our prior, um, pro that, our prior that the uh, Bob is a terrorist is, is 20%, and we'll assume that if Bob's a terrorist, there's a 50 50 chance that he's actually in the near neighborhood of knowing that guy. Um, and, and of course, uh, and, and so the only one that is maybe a little bit hard to get is what is the probability that two random people are in the same near neighborhood? Uh, to explore that, we'll use a random graph model. Uh, we'll use, in particular, an erosh renyi model. This has a couple of advantages. First, it is, um, rel makes the uh, analysis relatively simple. And second, I can show off my mastery of special characters. Um, so uh, the model is about the simplest random graph model you can imagine. There are n nodes. And each pair of nodes is connected with probability epsilon. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's chosen independently for every uh, pair. And we'll make the assumption at the bottom just to simplify the, um, uh, the analysis. All right, let's plug in values. We'll say there's about half a billion nodes. Um, that seems like a good guess for the number of domestic US phones. <coughs> we'll say each pair is connected with probability one in a million. That makes the degree of the average degree of the graph 500, which also seems like a reasonable guess. All right, now, um, so given that model, we can ask, we can say, for example, if near neighborhood means that the distance is less than or equal to three, that's what the NSA has talked about in uh, much of their discussion of this program. Uh, it turns out that the probability that two random people are in each other's near neighborhood is about 22%. So plug, plug in those values to the, uh, uh, to the uh, grid and we get this. Um, and now we can work these things out. The probability that Bob's a terrorist if he's in the near neighborhood of the of known bad guy is 36%. That's up from the 20% prior. If he's not in the near neighborhood, we go from 20% down to 14%. Uh, and that the expected entropy gain is uh, 0.04 bits. Not that much. So why is that? What's, what's, the, what's the expected entropy gain? Um, so basically, it's the, well, that's a little bit complicated. Actually, let me, let me skip that. Um, in the interest of time, sorry. Um, well, so here's roughly what it is. Um, so um, in the beginning, so it's more or less a measure of the change in the um, uh, in the analysts um, 
uh, uncertainty with respect to whether Bob is a terrorist or not. So there are two cases. Um, what, what this is, um, is really an attempt to get at the idea that, um, that um, you're much more likely to be in the bottom case um, where, um, uh, in the case where you're not in the near neighborhood and therefore that you don't gain very much knowledge going from 20% to 14%. Right. Um, let me, so why is that? Um, why is it that you don't get much advantage? And the real reason you don't get much advantage, in particular that you only go from 20 to 36%, it's not very good for confirming that Bob is a bad guy, is, um, uh, is the, the upper right box. That's false positives. Right? So false positives happen 18% of the time. True positives happen only 10% of the time. And therefore, um, a positive doesn't really help you that much. Um, and so obviously, if you want this, um, this uh, system to be better at actually catching bad guys, you need to reduce what's it, the number of false positives. And the way to do that is just, the, and, and that 18%, that basically is driven by the probability that two random people are in the near neighborhood. And the way to make that lower is to reduce the size of the near neighborhood. So if you reduce the size of the near neighborhood to distance less than or equal to two, two hops, then the probability um, in this model is about 0.05%, um, which is way, way lower. Now the grid looks like this. That upper right um, cell, which is the false positive rate, is, um, uh, is way smaller. And now the probability that Bob's a terrorist, given that he's in the neighborhood, is 99.6%. So that actually is pretty strong confirmation. Whereas if he's not in the new neighborhood, we go from the 20% higher down to 11.1%. Um, now look at this. The president said um, in his speech, effective immediately will only pursue phone calls that are two steps removed from the number associated with the terrorist organization instead of the current three. It was believed that the NSA had already decided they liked two hops better than the three. This is basically why. Um, three hops is way too big. You have all kinds of false positives. And that has two negative effects. One, it makes the analysis not work that well. And second, um, lawyers who are suing the NSA make annoying claims about how nearly everyone is close to a terrorist in the graph, which is pretty much true if the number of terrorists is um, more than a few. You kill too many innocents. Sorry? You kill too many innocents. You will identify too many innocents, at least. Yeah, yeah. identify them. Yeah, and that's, that's, that is indeed a problem. So Sorry. Do we know that the, the scenario that you mentioned is the one that the way that they're using the data. Because I can imagine if you had a suspect, you might say you don't really care about finding other suspects necessarily. You might care where that person is going to travel tomorrow or speak yeah. or something. Ah, right. So, well, this gets kind of interesting. Um, and this, can, this connects to complicated questions about legal authority. Um, we know that in a non-US setting, for non-US persons, um, the NSA has done all kinds of things like trying to figure out which people travel together, which people tend to be together um, um, by looking at location information. Whether they get, whether they routinely get location information domestically from phones um, without, a, without a specific warrant um, is not exactly clear. Probably they don't. We know that if they get a warrant, if they had a 20% prior that Bob is a terrorist, um, and I'll talk about this later, they could get a warrant to basically find out almost everything about what Bob does. Um, but um, that's not information that they are legally authorized to gather routinely about everyone domestically, as far as we know. That's a lot of caveats, but unfortunately, <laughs> they have to, have to do that. Yes. Yeah, do you know whether they combine data from other uh, uh, sources, like from social networking, uh, um, and chats, to enhance or...? Yeah, so um, this also gets complicated. Yeah. Um, the court orders that authorize the NSA to gather this information domestically, put limits on how they can use it. Um, and in particular, what they say is the information, when it's collected directly from a phone company, is supposed to go into a special zone which is called the collection store and then um, they're allowed to query that only when they have something called reasonable articulable suspicion about an individual. Then they can use that individual as the starting point as the known bad guy in, a, um, in an analysis. Um, the results of any such query are allowed to go into a different database called the um, corporate store. And once it's there, they can do whatever they want with it. Uh, and so some um, commentators believe that what they're really doing, uh, that this program is a tricky way of um, essentially um, finding ways, that contact chaining is a tricky way of 
um, trying to um, vacuum up as much information that is in this very limited collection store and get it into the corporate store where they can mix it with other data and do whatever they want. That's a kind of end run around a, um, the legal protections for Americans' data. Um, and there's some debate about whether that's the way they actually use it. Um, this step from three steps to two um, actually to me is an indicator that um, uh, is an argument against that, um, that claim. Um, because if the goal was to make as much data as possible be the results of a query and therefore not legally protect it anymore, um, then they want to stay with the biggest possible umbrella so they can suck as much as possible into, um, uh, into the unprotected state. Um, we don't really know how much information in the form of query replies has been integrated with other stuff. Um, I'm not sure they know. Um, they seem to have um, um, challenges in administering and tracking the history of all this data and making sure that the right data stays in the right database and doesn't leak across into a boundary, doesn't leak across a boundary into a state where it, there are fewer procedural controls. Um, but it, it, you know, as you know, if, if you know how, uh, if you know about the challenges of ensuring compliance with complicated rules while processing data, it's hard to do, uh, and they don't seem that great. Very happy to send the cool thing. So when I go my bank to find out the balance, for instance, mm -hmm. like, and I yeah. notice like my dashboard. Yeah. Is that content? That is content, yes. Purely um, content. It's not, it, the information to right. dial and connect is, um, is considered metadata. But right. even, if, even if you're pressing it on the keyboard, like, yeah. yeah. Once the call is connected, everything else that happens is content. Yes. So is this really a meaningful statement? I mean, it seems to me that you still need to collect the same amount of data regardless of the brand. It collects it all. Right, so it's, they collect it all. So the model is they collect it all, and then there are limits on the kinds of queries they're allowed to do against it. The court orders that authorize the collection say you can collect it, but you can only do the following queries, um, which is a little bit weird. You may not remember anything about that in the Constitution's discussion of warrants, but nonetheless, um, that's what the courts have done. So here's that um, you know would, words like this in a in a speech like this are extremely carefully yes. worded, right? And this one clearly has been very carefully worded. That's right. Um, yet for the vast you know 99.9 percent .9 of the population means nothing that three has become two. Right? Yes. So this is this is this is said this would have been said for a reason because the number of words in something like this is very scarce. So there's absolutely no right. Effect. So who who is this meant for? Um. It's an interesting question. One thing it's meant for probably is the various judges who are ruling on the constitutionality of this program. Because there have been very effective arguments that, um, that the probability, essentially um, the sort of argument that I showed before that there's a 22% chance that a random person is within three hops of, um, of, a, of any given um, other person. And therefore, if you believe there are, say, 50 um, uh, legitimate terrorism suspects in the U.S. at any given time or in the world, um, that the odds that any one of us are within three hops of at least one of those is actually pretty high. Um, and that argument has gotten a lot of traction with the judges. So by knocking it down to two, it does two things. First, it is um, uh, it helps with in their legal argument. And number two, it to those people who are insiders and sort of you know follow all the ins and outs of this, it might look like a significant concession. But it's in fact a concession that they had already made for their own reasons. Um, you're right, it's a big sacrifice. And it was presented as, look, this is this big thing we're giving you. Um, even though um, the third half doesn't seem to really help that much. In the back. Um, sorry, it seems as though a lot of the, the sense of what the, the difference between three and two actually matters is really dependent on the underlying graph structure. Yeah. So actually, and I'll come back to that if I may. Sure. Um, because this. <coughs> This kind of random graph is not, um, is not the kind of graph that you see in a real social network. Um, let me come back to that in, in, in a little while. Uh, it turns out that the exact form of the graph does, actually let me do it now. Um, it turns out that um, they want to eliminate high, so real graphs differ in a few ways. One is uh, that they're power law graphs, and in particular that there are some nodes with very high degree. But they, uh, but they, um, they identify and those nodes and eliminate them from the analysis. And the reason makes perfect sense that the fact that you and I, let's say, both called United Airlines customer service within the last five years 
doesn't really say anything about whether we, um, we know each other. Um, that those particular links are not indicative of any kind of a terrorist plot and do generate a lot of false positives. And so it makes sense to knock them out of the analysis. Right? So high degree nodes already get neutralized um, in the analysis. And so the variance in degrees doesn't matter as much as you think. The second thing to say is that the only thing that really matters in some sense is the size of the near neighborhood. That PN parameter is the only thing that matters. What's the probability that two random people are in each other's near neighborhood? And that doesn't depend so much on the exact um, distribution from which the graph is drawn. Um, and in fact, you can imagine that there's a kind of dial that they turn to try to get the, uh, the best value of this. You want a near neighborhood that's large enough that there is a substantial chance that two terrorists who are trying to avoid it will accidentally stumble within each other's near neighborhood with high enough probability, while at the same time dialing down the probability that two random people will be in the same room. That's more or less the, um, uh, your goal. And so you're going to choose a PN, um, which uh, does well for that. And I think it's going to be around 0.05% anyway, regardless of the exact form of the graph. So that turns out, I think, not to matter so much. So given that terrorists are hopefully not that common in the population, yeah. when you look at absolute numbers, yeah. Would, wouldn't they end up still with more false positives even yeah. in the... Yeah, so we'll, we'll get there. Actually, we'll get there. Right, so um, here we have, we have this. Remember this. Um, now, um, you know, some people might be uneasy. What do you mean there's a 99.6% chance that Bob is a terrorist just because he's in the near neighborhood of some other terrorist? Well, you have to remember, of course, there's a 20% prior here, which is very unusual. Uh, and that plays a big role. So if we, in fact, say, rather than our prior being uh, 0.2, 20%, what if it's one in a million, which is closer to what the number would be for just a, a random member of the population? Well, now that the grid looks like this, and now that false positive number looks pretty big. In fact, in that case, um, the probability that Bob's a terrorist, if he's in the near neighborhood, is still 0.1%. And if he's not, well, it's half in a million. Um, and you gain almost nothing. Um, and so that makes sense, right? If you start with no knowledge, you don't really get much out of this uh, because, uh, because of the way that things, um, uh, the grid lines up. Um, it's only where you have a, a prior which, puts you which substantially puts you substantially above what you think for a random member of the population. It's only then that you really get any kind of strong confirmation path. All right, so what do we see so far? Um, this works best if the neighborhood is relatively small. Um, it can work for confirming suspicion. You can go from 20% to 99.6%. Um, but it's not as good at eliminating suspicion. Uh, even with the 20% prior, you only, uh, if Bob's not in the new neighborhood, you, you, you're still above 10% um, probability that he's a bad guy. So, um, and this is more or less what uh, people who um, are involved with the program uh, will say off the record. Okay, um, other network structures, well I talked about this before, let me skip over that. The precise network structure doesn't matter so much. Okay, um, so um, we had recently this story that NSA is maybe collecting less than 30% of US call data, that strangely they are collecting a lot of data on landlines and not nearly as much on mobile phones, which seems to me backwards, right? You'd think that um, terrorists are more likely to use um, mobile phones. Um, nonetheless, um, this is the story. We now have NSA person say that's true under this program. So what we can model this easily suppose each node is, quote, covered with some probability C, and an edge is covered if, e if, the node, if either of the nodes it connects is covered. Because remember that the caller and callee um, both contribute, um, both have a record of a particular call. So now we can take our original graph, we can construct the covered graph, which includes just the covered nodes and edges, uh, or sorry, just the covered edges. Uh, and you can show that a two-hop path in, this, um, in the original graph survives with this probability. Um, it's down there. So if you have 25% coverage, um, a two-hop two path survives with about 30% probability. Okay, so what, where this was our initial um, uh, grid for a two-hop analysis, uh, we go to, uh, uh, to these new numbers if you assume a coverage of 25%. Uh, and that means that, this, that the uh, system is just as good at uh, confirming suspicion when that happens not nearly as good as ruling out, and you're much more likely to be in the not neighborhood case. Essentially what happens here is that you're usually, uh, it's, it's quite rare to uh, find Bob and no bad guy in the neighborhood. So this limited coverage makes the program um, substantially less useful. Now one question is why not use targeted subpoenas? Because in fact, if what you're looking for is Bob and known bad guy being within two hops of each other, 
Well, you can, you can subpoena known bad guy's um, records because he's a known bad guy. You can subpoena Bob's records given a 20% prior. All you need is reasonable articulable suspicion, which is a pretty low standard. Um, and so you can get both of their uh, records. You can, uh, you can construct both of their neighbor sets. And if they, their neighbor sets have any known in common, then Bob and known bad guy are two hops away. So um, you can always find a two-hop path when you have suspicion uh, by using targeted subpoenas, and you don't really need um, you don't really need uh, to collect all this data in advance in any case. Um, and so this calls into question: once you've moved to a two-hop uh, scenario, would you need this this uh, preemptive collection at all? The only case where you wouldn't is where you have suspicion that is above the base rate. Um, substantially above the base rate, but doesn't yet reach the level of suspicion that you would allow you to get a warrant for this information, which is relatively low. So there's a little window of, um, of, of prior probability of Bob being a terrorist, in which you can't subpoena Bob's records, but you might be able to get above that, um, uh, that threshold by, um, by finding Bob in the near neighborhood of the bad guy. I mean, the other, the other thing is it takes some effort that's... Uh, to get a subpoena. So I'm just yeah. wondering what's the scale here. If you were going to uh, follow that strategy, would be after yeah. 100, 1,000, a million, 10 million subpoenas. But um, it can't be 10 million, right? So if you, if you assume that the number of terrorists in the domestic U.S. population is relatively low, right, there can't be that many people for whom you have a substantial prior that they're a terrorist. Right? Um, and so um, uh, it can't be that large. We already know that there are, um, I think the answer is uh, it's already on order of a few hundred that are on the list and um, that they can, um, uh, and that, that, that probably won't go up a lot. I'm assuming they can get like a court order to uh, look at uh, the content of the codes if they want to. If they have strong enough suspicion, that requires stronger, stronger suspicion. Um, there's a Supreme Court precedent that says, um, that arguably says, that metadata, uh, that getting someone's phone metadata is not a search under the Fourth Amendment, and therefore the strong warrant requirement doesn't apply, but that getting content does require um, a, a very strong, does require a strong warrant. Um, and so there's a much higher standard to get access to content, even for um, even for foreign uh, intelligence purposes. But I'm sure you can do that. They can if they have strong enough suspicion. Yeah. So for in this scenario, for a known bad guy, they're presumably listening to all of his calls and um, all, monitoring all of known bad guys' communications continuously. Um, Bob with the 20% prior, I don't know if they can get his um, his content. This is begging for whether <clears throat> some of the, um, you know, the eigenvector-based prestige models where I inherit with some decay the prestige of, of uh -huh. uh, yes. people one hop, two hops, sure. because you would think that there's a very different interpretation to me being two hop away from yes. bin Laden in only one path versus right. in five different Lots paths. Lots of paths. And, and then I can get it on. Part of some clique with. Yeah. You know, so, so do you know, if, have you done any other, you know, that's I haven't done an analysis of that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're doing something like that. Um, one has to parse very carefully the statements that um, government people make about these programs to understand what they're doing. Um, and one needs to pay attention to which statements are made under oath and which are not. Um, and um, the, I think the contact chaining analysis is not that sophisticated. The redacted thing may be sophisticated. They're probably using sophisticated analysis on the non-domestic data set. One of the challenges they have here is because the court order they get um, specifies what the algorithm is, they need to be able to explain the algorithm to a judge. Um, and so it can't be too complicated. Um, actually, you have to pity the poor judges, right? The judges don't have the support or help of anyone who understands technology. In a regular case, if there's a criminal defendant and there's a fight about something like this, um, the, um, um, that the judge before deciding whether information can be used, um, can, the judge has a bunch of options. The judge can, um, there may be uh, an expert witness on behalf of the defendant who's arguing, uh, making an argument, or the judge can get a court appointed expert or a special master, someone who has expertise, to help them with this sort of thing. But um, that, um, these judges in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court don't have that. 
That's one of the reforms that um, people have talked about, but it's not clear if it's going to happen. Someday, perhaps, Congress will pass a law letting these judges actually get technical help. <laughs> but as of yet, um, they really don't. Um, the judges hear only what government, what the government tells them. They'll get a statement under oath from the you know, chief technology something at the NSA, but that's really the only source of technical input that the judges get. Uh, and I think they really struggle with it, and they know they're struggling with it. By the way, the same thing is true in Congress. In Congress, it's the members of the intelligence committees in the House and Senate who have access to um, classified briefings about this stuff, and there's a very limited number of staff who they're allowed to who are allowed to hear and, uh, and participate in these briefings, very limited, and they don't include anybody with technical expertise. Now, back in the good old days, my congressman from Princeton, Rush Holt, who is an actual scientist, was on the House Intelligence Committee, and he um, understood things like statistics and, and, and graphs and so on, um, but he's not anymore, um, and now he's retiring, so sad. Um, all right, let me move on. Um, or, oh, so I just had a quick question. Okay. So, so, so. If I understand correctly, NSA is allowed to do essentially whatever they want with foreign data Pretty much. without the process requirements. So is GCHQ also allowed to do whatever they want with foreign data? And if so, can they give it to NSA? <laughs> GCHQ is the British equivalent of NSA. Um, and um, as I understand it, they can do overseas stuff. And there's a question about whether they can just collect on each other's citizens and exchange data. The belief is that that's not OK. Um, that seems like common sense. That you know, NSA and GCHQ can't just say, we'll spy on each other's citizens and then exchange the data. But has that common sense been confirmed under us? <laughs> well, the question is whether, there's a few questions. One is, you know, has, has a court ruled on it? The other is, has the NSA general counsel or some, you know, authoritative DOJ lawyer given the NSA people guidance on this? Um, and I don't know for sure, but I would be very surprised if NSA people believed it was legal to do that. Um, so uh, they probably don't. Maybe uh, the answer is the data that they exchange the results, right? The, uh, the information. There might be, yeah. Some results can be exchanged. Um, there's, there's this other tricky issue of uh, information where they don't know whether the person is a U.S. person or not. Um, the question of how much obligation they have to try to find out. Um, and that's another way to, um, to slide around the uh, ban on collection on U.S. persons. Let me move on to the second part of the analysis and talk about, um, and pretty briefly, about possibilities for reorganizing the data. So this, again, is the recommendation five from the President's Review Panel. It says, um, we want to transition as soon as possible to a system in which the metadata is held not by the government, but by some private party. The President uh, told the, uh, in his speech, instructed the intelligence community and Attorney General, a bunch of lawyers, to develop options for a new technical approach to match capabilities, etc., without the government holding this metadata itself, and they're supposed to report back by March 28th. Okay, so here's roughly how the system works now, very schematically. You have a bunch of data, you have computing resources, and you have an NSA analyst, all this within the, uh, the NSA. And so one proposal that's been made is to take the data and move it outside the NSA have some kind of a private party custodian that holds the data rather than the NSA holding it. Um, or of course you can move the computing across that boundary, or if you're a computer scientist at all, you want to like put some computing on both sides. Yes? This obviously shows that there's there's no difference in the system that you're just shifting, you're just shifting, you know, yeah. whether it's whether yeah, so the NSA heading or they have a Google or Facebook heading over the computer awesome. or Amazon. Right, well, so the it's analyst is still sitting there being able to do the same the thing. The analyst could do the same stuff. Um, there, to the extent there are differences, the differences go to things like the risk of abuse. The abuse scenarios are somewhat different. For example, this one question is, is this stuff kept in a data center that NSA people can badge into? Um, or is it only um, the custodians people can badge into this and so on? Would it be a felony for an NSA person to go into that data center? Um, so there's various, there's various um, fraud and abuse scenarios that might be different. Um, there is increased accountability at this boundary in the sense that it's easier for this entity to, to log what passes across this boundary somehow or account it. So there are some differences. But in practice, what this probably amounts to is that the contractor who operates this program now continues to hold the data and they just um, change the access control list to some data in the rooms. Um, so maybe that's not so great. This is a little bit more interesting now, is to keep the data at the providers. Now the providers are already, in many cases, retaining this data for their own business purposes. 
And so why not let them keep it, um, maybe contribute some computing, but, um, uh, but uphold the data outside the NSA? So how are we going to design this? Well, you know, we're going to design for the usual thing computer scientists care about, performance, cost, and reliability. But we're also going to design for oversight. That is, we want an architecture that makes it easy for the legal processes and the political processes that are supposed to um, limit and control what the NSA does to operate. So we want to optimize for that. Yes. So how do you, in the current system, the data get into the data center of NSA? Does Verizon do a regular dump there, or do they? There's a daily that? transfer. Um, uh, the, the court order actually requires every each provider to turn over data on a daily basis. Um, how exactly that happens, we don't know. Whether they like, you know, whether a courier delivers it or whether it goes across the wire, I don't know. Um, but it is daily delivery of complete records for each day. For the foreign ones, it's where for the foreign ones they just scoop it up wherever they can get it. Um, for the foreign ones, they probably capture it off a wire somewhere. Um, that's that's the best guess. For the domestic stuff, it's a legal process. The phone companies under court order deliver data records. Okay. So this is what you want to optimize for. You can come up with some easy design principles. Um, to try to do, try to avoid replication of data. The more places the data is in, the more opportunity for our abuse. Try to avoid aggregation of data into one place. That also increases the possibility of abuse or a breach or something. Think about not just storage, but processing. When lawyers talk about this, they always talk about storage. But we're computer scientists. We actually care what, um, where the uh, computation happens, because that, well, for the obvious reasons. We want to design for accountability. Um, as well as other things, and we like to use actual computer science in thinking about this instead of um, instead of just um, saying, gee, that looks hard. Um, okay, so let's look at this design. This is the most attractive approach with respect to those um, uh, with respect to those design goals. Um, you avoid uh, aggregation of the data, you avoid replication. Um, one of the key questions is how long do these providers hold the data? So they hold it as long as they would hold it themselves for their business purposes, that is deleted at will, just like they do now, or would they be actually required to retain it for some length of time? That would require a new law, that would be controversial, but it's a thing that might happen, it's been discussed. Um, obviously it's best for privacy if the data is only held for as long as the companies want to hold it. Um, all right. So what kinds of stuff can we do in this kind of setting? One question is, can we support simple warrants to get data for individual people? And it turns out, yeah, that um, cryptographers have been all over this stuff for a while. Probably the best single publication on this is a blog post by Seni Kamara from last summer. Um, but the idea is pretty much this. You can have a protocol in which the telecom company encrypts their database in a particular way. They basically encrypt each record in a particular way with a key for that record. Um, that when the, when the court issues a warrant, it cryptographically commits to the warrant without saying which number the warrant is for, it cryptographically publicly commits to the fact that a warrant has been issued for a particular number. And they send the NSA the key to unlock that commitment. Um, then, when the NSA wants to do uh, execute the warrant, you have a secure multi-party computation that goes on between the telecom and the NSA. Basically, the uh, telecom um, uh, puts in their master key, which is used to generate the individual record keys here. The NSA puts in the identity of the number that they want to search and the, um, and, the, and the warrant, as well as the unlocking key for the warrant. And then you do a secure multi-party computation by the usual um, uh, cryptographer's methods. Um, and what you get is a computation that verifies that the warrant matches the number that is, whose records are being requested. Um, it calculates um, what is the, uh, the record key for the requested uh, phone number, and then it gives that key to the NSA, all without revealing to the phone company anything more, all, all without revealing anything more than this. That is, the telecom learns only that some warrant was executed. The NSA learns only um, what the unlocking key is for that record. They then unlock on their own. So this has all the properties you might want. Um, it reveals uh, the least possible information consistent with the phone company uh, actually holding uh, uh, holding title to the uh, control of the data. Um, and the NSA doesn't have to leak information about what it did, and yet you have accountability. So that's great. OK. No, but yes? There's a huge flaw in this system that you, you, know, you have the highest concentration of sort of you know, decryption technology and 
big iron and you're handing your entire quote encrypted unquote database yep. over to this group of people. People who are the best in the world. Best photographers in the world. It just seems to be sort of, it's the proposal sort of dead in the water for that reason. Um, I'm not so sure that that's true. And the reason is that if the NSA engages in some, sorry, if the NSA engages in some kind of big project to try to break this particular system, that that would be a clear, that would be a clear violation of the law and would require a conspiracy that um, would um, um, that would have a higher chance of getting discovered compared to one where the data is just sitting in a data center somewhere and you know every disgruntled sysadmin has access to it because we know disgruntled that I say sysadmins could get a lot of data. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe with um, accountability, you want to add auditability. For the I, I think auditability is part of accountability. It's one of the ways you get accountability is that records can be audited and that if there is a dispute or a challenge later that you can sort of unwrap a record of what happened and verify that it was done there. Yeah. All right. So this is simple warrants. Um, you can ask about these computations on the call graph. Can we do these computations in this kind of, um, uh, with the data disaggregated? Well, remember these are the two computations. The first one is easy to analyze. The second one, um, not so much. Uh, let's look at contact chaining first. Um, contact chaining is easy. Contact chaining is essentially a form of breadth-first search, um, and breadth-first search is really easy to parallelize in this way. With basically two round trips to each provider, you can do uh, you can explore the two hop neighborhood of um, uh, from any point. Uh, that's easy to do, um, and that's like you know a, a freshman or sophomore assignment. Um, so that's good news. Uh, this one, as I said, kind of hard to analyze. <laughs> um, depends on what, what exactly the uh, algorithm is, but we can say some things. For example, if it's a MapReduce style computation, that actually works particularly well, right? MapReduce first computes some kind of, does some kind of computation on each separate data item, and then it aggregates them together, sort of tree-wise, and it's very easy to do the map part within, within each provider, do a reduction within each provider, and then send results back for final combination uh, back at the NSA. So if it's map reduced, that works pretty efficiently. And there's some hints that the, they, uh, that the uh, things they do might be map reduced. For example, we believe, based on some records, that the, that the data is stored in um, a system called Accumulo, which is, um, a, um, a, which is the NSA's um, version of, uh, which is the NSA's favorite map reduced system. Um, and so there's some indication that they may be doing map reduced style computations of those uh, parallelized very easily in this So why would they find that? And why is it important to find that? The fact that... Yeah, they, like, if that's what they're doing. The fact that they're doing why it... Why would they find that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, well, so, so let me give you an example. Um, and that, here's the next one, similarity search. So, um, one reason why they might be hiding the particular analysis is that that analysis is designed to counter some particular kind of tradecraft that, that um, adversaries are using, which the adversaries think is working. For example, it could be that the adversaries are switching phones. They throw away a phone, get a new burner phone, and switch to it. Right? And so you might use some kind of algorithm like a form of similarity search to try to counter that. That is, you say, um, well, gee, this phone went inactive at some time. Among all the phones that went active at about that time, let's look for one that has a neighbor set similar to the, uh, to the previous no bad phone. Um, and so if you're doing something like that, um, it's certainly to your advantage if your adversaries believe that something they're doing is effective when in fact you have a method against it. So that might be the kind of thing that's going on here. That's one reasonable guess as to what this uh, redacted analysis is. But presumably um, it's being withheld for a reason like that. That it has something to do with um, counting a particular form of tradecraft that's being used. So if only 20, to, best guess. If only 20 to 30 percent of calls are being collected, um, then presumably that's, a, and you believe that most of those are landline. Mm -hmm. That means a very small fraction of mobile ones. And yes. So, so what you just said doesn't even apply to what they're collecting. Is well, there some, right. I mean, actually gets to another question, which is, is there some technical reason or historical reason why it would be landline rather than mobile? Because they all collect billing records, right? Yeah, they all yeah. So this is one, this to me is one of the biggest unanswered questions about how the program operates. Um, and there's different theories, there's different hypotheses about this. One is that what they care about most is foreign, is one end foreign calls. That it, that is, that what they care about is whether people tend to call the same foreign numbers, communicate with the same foreign numbers. 
right? And if that's the case, and if you have ubiquitous collection overseas, especially in certain target areas um, where, um, where calls to which are the most interesting, um, then maybe you're fine with 20%, 30% domestic coverage. Um, so that's one uh, possibility, that they just don't care that much. Um, as to why it's primarily landlines, um, that's less clear. Um, what I hear, so NSA people don't talk about this 20 to 30% business or the reasons for it on the record. So one has to pick up indirectly from reporters or through reporters' questions um, what it is that the reporters are hearing off the record. Mm -hmm. um, and what they're hearing is, as far as I can tell, is that there are technical difficulties with, um, with inhaling uh, mobile phone company records. That's kind of hard to believe. Um, at least, it's hard, to, it's hard to see why that would be the case. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one possibility is that, in fact, they don't care that much about domestic collection, and they just kind of let it slide. That in the early years of the program, they um, went to landlines first because, you know, when people in, the, in um, intelligence agencies think about phones, that's what they think about. Um, that, and then later, given the shift from um, the trend from landline to mobile, that they just haven't caught up. Um, but it seems likely that they've actually lost coverage of certain carriers. Now there's another issue which has to do with foreign ownership or partial foreign ownership of some of the mobile phone companies. Um, and there may be a desire not to serve these kinds of, um, of warrants on, on non-American companies. I've heard that speculation. I'm not sure whether that's the case or not. Uh, but it is a little bit of a mystery. You would think that um, the work to get another court order is, uh, is negligible. Um, the technical work to be able to inhale data in whatever format the next provider gives to you is not, you know, it's pretty trivial. Um, and so it's hard to see why not, why they're not doing this. Um, you're left with either it just doesn't matter to them, domestic calls don't matter very much um, in their analysis, that's a possibility. Um, you're left with the possibility that they can get the same data some other way. Uh, but it's hard to see what that would be, how they could legally get that. It's a radio. Data. Um, well, wireless is the radio, you can pick it up by cell Right, whatever. but that would not actually be legal without a separate warrant. Well, if the military does it anyway. Have they actually said that they don't collect their data from uh, mobile? They've said that they don't collect data domestically over the air from mobile phones without its <coughs> a targeted warrant. Could Meaning be. that they will. Um, with, a, with an individualized warrant, um, do pretty much anything to get data on an individual. Could it possibly they be don't sweep yeah. up mobile phone data <coughs> domestically in a broad way uh, without a warrant. What about VoIP calls or Skype? Or yeah. This is, I mean, this is another piece of the pie, right, besides mobile, which they don't seem to have good coverage over. We know that they, have, that they use individualized warrants to get data from VoIP providers, especially Skype. Um, but um, they don't. But they probably don't have much coverage of um, of metadata pursuant to these broad warrants domestically from VoIP. And um, I should yeah. score two weeks and then I'll have to yeah. All right. So let me move on. Similarity search is still efficient. <coughs> let, let me just close um, with some closing thoughts, and then I'm happy to um, uh, to discuss a, a bit informally. Um, one of the things that's happening as a result of all of this discussion and the, um, and the, colli and the mild collision between computer science and um, intelligence and, and lawyers um, is um, some changes to the debate. Um, but really, we need further changes to the public policy debate about this um, in order to get to a better place. To have it be not just a debate about how to trade off security against privacy, but also a debate that's about how to achieve accountability, and in particular, how to use the things that computer scientists know how to do to get enhanced accountability within the system. Often, people who don't think like computer scientists just don't um, imagine that accountability is even possible in certain settings where you know, any one of our students would know immediately that it is. Um, and so one of the things we can do is to try to push accountability and talk about accountability solutions in this kind of space.
There's one other way in which the um, debate needs to change, um, and that's really, and, and maybe it's starting to, and that <coughs> is exemplified by two quotes I'm going to give you, or quotes from two things. Um, this is a column by Walter Pinkus in the Washington Post, actually on Christmas Day, uh, 2013. Um, and he is a very well-connected and knowledgeable reporter on national security and intelligence matters. And I'll blow up the part I'm, I'm most interested in. Um, and so here he is. Um, this column is his attempt to summarize views of some people in the intelligence community about all of this. So he asks, should the United States engage in secret, covert, or clandestine activity if the public cannot be convinced of the necessity and wisdom of such activities, should they be leaked or disclosed? To intelligence professionals, that's a bizarre question. Now, to me, it's, this, is the, this is the question that we should start with in discussing this. And it seems like, from sort of an abstract public policy standpoint, we should be starting with this question. But to some of the intelligence pro professionals, it's not just an interesting question. It's not just a strange question. It's, I mean, it's, well, it is a bizarre question. Um, and he goes on to say this, again, summarizing the view of many in, in the intelligence community rather than giving his own view. The prime reason for secrecy is that you don't want the targets to know what you're doing. Okay, that makes sense. But often in democracies, another reason is that you don't want your citizens to know what their government is doing on their behalf to keep them secure as long as it's within their country's law. Now this, to me, is really, um, really troubling. And the idea that many people in our intelligence community think this way um, is, uh, I think, really bad news. Because this amounts to an assertion that um, aggressive intelligence collection is incompatible with democracy. That the public and the political process cannot have meaningful oversight over intelligence. Um, people shouldn't know, and as long as it's within the law, but of course the law is made by um, members of Congress who also are relatively uninformed about these things because they have um, a little more information than us, but not much. We've seen over and over members of Congress reacting with um, anger on learning certain things that um, one would have expected the overseers to know. Um, so this is really worrisome. And, um, uh, and to me, this is part of the reason that we've gotten into the mess that we're in. Now, the good news is that just last week, James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, gave an interview in which he stated a slightly different view. He said the problems facing the community over its collection of film records could have been avoided. I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. Had we been transparent about this from the outset, right after 9-11, and said both to the American people and their elected representatives, we need to cover this gap, we need to make sure this never happens to us again. So here is what we're going to set up. Here's how it's going to work, and why we have to do it, and here are the safeguards. If we had done that, Clapper says, we wouldn't have had the problem we had. Now this is the kind of thinking that we want to be seeing more from our intelligence officials, not that um, intelligence collection is incompatible with public knowledge, but the idea that public knowledge and public and political buy-in is a necessary prerequisite to actually engaging in programs like this. We don't need to know necessarily who you have a warrant to spy on, but we want to know what the conditions on getting a warrant, how many there are, and what happens when you have one. Um, and so this at least is a sign of progress in the bigger political picture. Yeah, but this was a TIA program and they extra tried to push around when the government learned about it, it wasn't immediate reaction to it. Well, so it's true that it was not it was not good policy to do this. They got away with it for a long time. And in fact, although it's now under the legal umbrella, for the first few years of this program, there was no uh, legal authorization at all uh, other than a memo signed by the president. Um, and so the program was, I think, pretty clearly illegal in its first few years. It then came under the legal umbrella, but um, based on arguably uh, legal arguments. Um, but had the intelligence community actually gone to the public after 9-11 and said, here's what we're doing, there would have been a debate. It probably would have been ratified at that time. But when the program came up for reauthorization in Congress, three years later and three years after that and so on, we could have had a debate about whether we wanted to keep doing this and, what, um, and what the safe, whether the safeguards were good enough. Um, and we didn't have the opportunity to have that. The only way we could actually have a public discussion was via these Snowden leaks and now they're back and forth and this painstaking um, process of extracting information from the government by reporters, by analyzing leaked documents, and by um, the byproducts of litigation. 
This is far from ideal, but at least we're having a conversation, and at least Mr. Clapper is saying that maybe they should have done it a different way from the beginning. That's a little bit of good news. I have a, excuse me, question and a comment. The, the question is, purely with a computer scientist's hat on, mm -hmm. is there a devil's advocate argument that says, if you, either via encryption or some injective function that, that anonymizes who it is, wouldn't you want for your machine learning to be at its best, mm -hmm. to give it the best sample of, you know, ones and zeros in the classification of good yes, guys yeah. and bad guys to see what a good old regular first generation immigrant does in which what pattern he calls his parents back in, you know, uh, Asia or wherever, yeah. so that you can improve your algorithms. And here, the, the notion of unless you have a warrant, you can't do much. If, if this is as you talk about going to work, it's sort of as if you can't do any unsupervised learning to thin out your features and see some random reason to your data, nor can you have a good sample off of which to train your algorithm, including the good cases and the bad cases, right? So are there any thoughts to saying, well, the key is to figure out how to fudge the data, but not to prevent the guys, in fact, from, if anything, to make their algorithms more discriminating so there are fewer false positives? So that's my question. Sure, sure. Uh, well, it's a good question, and there's no doubt that you can probably get better analysis results at the margin if you have more and more accurate data. Um, that said, um, I think that the intelligence agencies are far from the cutting edge in most of the analysis that they're doing. Um, what we have seen is, um, I think doesn't get to the level of sophistication that um, a you know, Stanford graduate student in machine learning could do. Um, let alone um, what you might expect from a very large and well-resourced um, agency. Um, I, that's one thing I would say. The other thing is that the warrant requirement is not really a matter of policy for us. It comes from the Constitution. And there's not a lot, legally, there's not really flexibility on that. Um, the, there's only the anonymization. If, if somehow the fudging of who the endpoints are just for purposes of training. You might be able to make an argument that if you can really protect the privacy of individuals um, in the way that the data set is analyzed or used, um, then you might be able to get around, then a warrant might not be required. But obviously, you know, you have to make a technically sound argument in favor of the um, privacy-preserving properties of what you're doing, which is pretty hard to do. The real, con my concern from a policy standpoint is that you get, um, is that uh, if you go down that road, what you get is very lame anonymization. For example, I haven't mentioned it in the talk, but all kinds of people, including the president, have said that we don't collect names, we, only, we don't collect your name, we only collect your phone number, so it's not personally identified. <laughs> right? And that doesn't pass the laugh test among computer scientists. And yet, you know, the president of the United States has said that as a justification for this program with this great face. My concern about this from a policy standpoint is if you say we're going to allow the data to be used in an anonymized fashion, what you're going to get is something like that. Uh, you're going to get is first an argument that it already is. Um, and if that doesn't stand up, then something which is uh, only marginally bad. Um, let me just say one more very quick thing in response to that. And that is that the, um, if you look at the history of the Fourth Amendment, the requirement of an individualized warrant was designed um, to, uh, was a response to um, uh, to general warrants, which said that um, the king's agents could go and search anywhere they wanted um, in investigating a particular thing. Um, that is, that it was that delegation of discretion to the law enforcement officer to search, to decide what to search, which was, which the Fourth Amendment's particularized warrant requirement was designed to uh, prevent. There really wasn't a consideration of you know machine learning and big data analysis to try to build models um, in uh, uh, that came into the thinking there. Um, and uh, but you can imagine you can imagine someday that someone would try to make a novel argument in court that this process is sufficiently privacy preserving that even though it uses your data, uh, no warrant is needed. I think we're pretty far from the point where that kind of analysis would be able to convince a judge. I think that's actually good. On the whole, yes. So, so I'm still seeing a sort of a big discrepancy here. So, imagine, I mean, imagine for a moment that we, you know, somehow managed to achieve this watershed public policy victory 
And like all of this analysis is done with multi-party computations and you know, NSA commits to everything in advance and the public sees everything that they're doing. Uh, and in order to implement this at the end of the day, they contract RSA and uh, get it implemented with state-of-the-art Google EC. <laughs> and then, uh, right, and then, and then, you know, somehow they have these internal mechanisms where they can actually get whatever they want if they really want to. Like, do you see, I mean, do you see any hope of preventing that or what, like, what, what kind of political climate would enable this? I think there are some, actually some benefits of using a technological protection which is not perfect but requires um, right, so knowing how to break through. This is like you know locking the information in a safe. Sure. It doesn't make it impossible to get, but it's a big bright blinking light that says that you are uh, so I guess what violating I'm expectations is, and the law by breaking in. Right. I guess what I'm getting at is it can be arbitrarily more creative than just doing crypt analysis. Oh, of course. Right. That's right. Um, and so we, you obviously need to think carefully about how to design these things. Really, this is one of the reasons why uh, in the policy world, people think in terms of oversight rather than prevention, accountability rather than prevention, that there are so many ways to work around any kind of restriction that you put on that um, the restrictions do two things. They, um, they provide a boundary which people know they shouldn't cross and whose crossing will be penalized, number one, and they tend to increase accountability by doing things like increasing the size of the conspiracy required to, uh, uh, to carry something out. Um, and those are valuable um, processes as well. It, uh, yeah, it just seems like, it seems, such, it seems at odds with the, the spirit of the intelligence community to ever prove a universal in a sense, to ever say like, not only are we not doing this under this program, but actually, this is a list of all the programs, so you can see we're not doing it. Well, they're not going to give a list of all the programs. Right, but there are two kinds of denials you get from them. One is, we are not doing X. And the other is, we are not doing X under this program. And people have learned, um, people learn pretty quickly that, you know, the under this program form of denial is not really a denial at all. Um, and if you look at things like the transcripts of congressional hearings, you see from you know, starting in June of 2013, uh, pretty quickly you see the members of Congress asking the follow-up question when they get an under this program um, answer. Uh, and saying, I'm not asking under this program, I'm asking in general, can you give me a flat statement if you are or are not doing X? Um, and as a consequence, we're getting a lot fewer of these under this program cases. Um, what you are getting is caveats, and the caveats have changed. The caveats are less like now, but it's less common to have it under this program caveat and more common to have a caveat that says domestically or for U.S. persons um, or, uh, and so on. Um, or, uh, and of course, there's always the caveat that with the target of the moment, they'll get it. One last question. Right. So, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so, when you have these discussions and policies going forward saying that we need to change the program and so on, they actually uh, all the current leads or do they acknowledge them in some sense? You know, for example, I was thinking of all these like love leads, right? But the yes. guys I'm also spying on. Well, that. absolutely right. So, um, do these reports say that oh, this, this sort of thing would have prevented such and such? And such all of these um, abuses, yeah. So, what's tricky is that um, you, you can imagine two kinds of mechanisms, right? Um, one kind of mechanism that tries to perform sort of hard computer science access control, strong computer science access control to data where there's some technical um, condition that needs to be satisfied before something can happen. But that turns out to be hard to do in practice where the criteria um, involve, um, might involve evidence that's outside the, the system, right? No, and so we see that acknowledging the fact that these, yeah. these bad uh, these abuses happened and they have been leaked whether they classified or not. And they're yeah. to protect against them, or do they say in the abstract sense that, oh, we will make sure that no Well, there's two answers to that, I think. One is, um, um, even if there's human discretion in the system, there are things you can do to design for accountability to require reporting, require a reason to be given and committed to at the time by the person, and to have some kind of auditing of those decisions at the time. Um, so that, that helps. Um, uh, with respect to you know, how much impact this has on the discussion, um, the answer, unfortunately, is that um, rhetorically it has less impact than you might think. That um, 
the tendency is to say that any future abuses are purely hypothetical, um, and we don't need to rebut those because they haven't happened. Any past abuses um, are, um, that's water under the bridge, and we've already fixed that problem. Um, any current abuses we probably don't know about. We don't know of any current abuses, um, and, um, and so there's a tendency to argue away particular localized abuses in the system. Um, systemic abuse is hard. The other thing that tends to be under-recognized is systemic error. That is, um, there was a, for example, there was a design problem which caused um, contact chaining to be done from thousands of addresses without the appropriate legal authorization because there was some, some condition that code was supposed to be checking which it wasn't. Um, or some label that was supposed to be on certain data that wasn't. Um, and that gets um, ignored in argument as well. It's a real problem. Um, and it really stems from the, um, the fact, that the uh, unfortunate fact that fact-based debates um, have difficulty happening in the political world. Um, it's hard to make facts stick, and people are not, are not uh, afraid enough of getting caught misleading about the facts. Right? In our community, we, on our good days, um, are engaged in a collective search for truth. Um, we're at least pretty embarrassed if we get caught saying something false um, in front of a big room, um, especially if we knew it was false at the time we said it. Um, but in political debate, um, that's sometimes just a credit thing to do. Um, that's one of the most frustrating things about going to Washington. <laughs> right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.